and a happy Independence Day to you coming from North Star Oasis. I hope you had a great 4th of July. Uh, I know we're now in the, I know we're now finally into the warm weather phase of the year. I know, I remember six, six months ago, 17 below zero, it was frigid, cold, couldn't wait for it to warm up while well, I'm enjoying summer. I hope you are too. Uh, with the 4th of July, it usually means on North Star Oasis that we cover something about the Civil War. And that is not going to change this year as we are going to go right into our Prager University segment about how Abraham Lincoln changed the world in only two minutes. President Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address is one of the most famous speeches ever given. It is stunning in its brevity. Ten sentences, 272 words, and delivered in just over two minutes. Few have said more with less. Lincoln delivered the address on November 19, 1863. He was in Gettysburg to dedicate a national military cemetery to the Union soldiers who fell at the Battle of Gettysburg four months earlier. The North's victory here was one of the pivotal battles of the American Civil War. Lincoln begins this way. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Lincoln goes back in time, not to the signing of the Constitution, but to the Declaration of Independence. The Constitution, in forming our government, was the product of many compromises, most notably, slavery. In contrast, the Declaration of Independence declares our enduring national values. In one sentence, Lincoln summarizes the American project, liberty for all and equality of all. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. Lincoln's assertion is twofold. First, the United States is unique. No nation was ever founded on a commitment to liberty and equality. And the Civil War was a trial to see if a nation based on such lofty ideals could survive. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. Gettysburg, Pennsylvania was the site of the bloodiest battle of America's bloodiest war. In three days of fighting, 51,000 Americans on both sides, Union and Confederate, were killed, wounded, captured, or missing. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. Lincoln is not in Gettysburg to celebrate the Union victory. Rather, he explains that those who fought were the loyal guardians of the American experiment. With their blood, they watered the tree of liberty. As Lincoln himself knew, how could his words ever compare to that sacrifice? He even speculates that the world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. Ironically, the world remembers what our 16th president said. But do we remember the actions of those who fought at Gettysburg? Lincoln answers that question with a challenge. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. Those who fought and died shouldered our nation's enduring values through the refining fire of Gettysburg and the Civil War. Lincoln points to them and challenges the living. Are we prepared to heed their example, to do what is necessary to advance the founding ideals of the Declaration of Independence? Remember, the Gettysburg Address is a wartime speech. Lincoln is stealing his contemporaries for the many battles, burdens, and responsibilities still ahead but he's also looking to the future. He is looking to us. Lincoln concludes that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth.
The Union won the Civil War. Slavery ended. And with it, the values of liberty and equality were given a new birth. However, the struggle for liberty and equality continued and persists today. Lincoln foresaw this. To remain a nation dedicated to the proposition that all men, all people, are created equal, and that government of, by, and for the people shall not perish from the earth, these are the unfinished work and the great task remaining of every generation. Ours is no exception. Are we up to President Lincoln's challenge? I'm Professor Doug Dowds of the Army War College for Prager University. So are we up to Lincoln's challenge? And remember, the Battle of Gettysburg had occurred on July 1st through 3rd of 1863. So there is a tie to where we're at now in the calendar month. And it was, of course, a very important battle. But it wasn't the only thing that happened as at the um, high tide of the Civil War. There was also the ending of the Vicksburg Campaign. And with us today to discuss Civil War history and Vicksburg is Dr. Joe Fitzharris, retired professor of history from the University of St. Thomas. Joe, thanks for uh, joining us on North Star My Oasis. Pleasure, Jeff. So what got you interested in history? Oh, heavens, that, that goes back. We've got some, an hour. <laughs> some kind of, something like 60 years. Uh, I've always had an interest in history. And uh, the Civil War has been a key part of that. And so. Uh, what, about, what, what about the Civil War got you interested? Oh, I suppose like most kids, the, the military side of it. But uh, as you get into it, the people side becomes more interesting. and. Uh, my interests happen to be uh, economic. Oh, uh, really? Yes, that, I was an economic historian at first. And the war, of course, is a good place for economic historians to go berserk. And then I'm sure you've read uh, plenty of Charles Beard. Beard, yes, and all sorts of other strange people. <laughs> uh, the economics of slavery, or the econometrics of slavery, probably better. Uh, all of the... Uh, Nice little books on the business of war. So, uh, so where did you uh, go to college? I graduated from the College of St. Thomas 50 years ago. It's now the university. I uh, took a master's at the University of Minnesota and then got my PhD at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. All, all in history? Yeah. Okay. So. And then you started teaching at St. Thomas? Or I where? did. And I never thought I'd. Uh, retire from there, but uh, I did. When did you retire? 2011. 2011. Yes. And 2011 was when, after a 15-year break, I decided to go back to school, and I went to Concordia St. Paul, another private school in St. Paul, and that's when I got my bachelor's in history. So your career in academia was ending as mine was just beginning. Yeah. Good transition. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, we're going to actually take a look at a video put out by the what's now called the Battlefield Trust, or the American Battlefield Trust, formerly the Civil War Trust. And they come up with a series of the Civil War in four minutes. And we've used a few of them on some of our Civil War shows in the past. And this one, we're going to look at what is called War Department Researching the Civil War. When the Civil War Trust comes out into the field and speaks with historians and we analyze battles and battlefields, how do these historians know what happened during the Civil War? Obviously, as far as I know, none of them were there. But we, of course, start with primary sources. And the most primary sources of all are, of course, the earliest accounts of the battle. Um, most Civil War officers, or at least many, submitted official reports for their units um, after a particular fight. Um, you, of course, have early photos of a battlefield. And those photos, despite some myths about photographers moving bodies around, all the time really don't lie and then of course you have the battlefields themselves um, that really help as primary sources you also have early cartography maps that shows what a battlefield looked like at the time and you can put these early sources together and really start to understand what happened during the war 
To that, we can add a copious amount of post-war um, accounts. You have early newspaper accounts. You also have regimental histories written about particular units. You have veterans' newspapers, um, like the National Tribune and the Confederate Veteran. You have um, large numbers of various secondary books written about particular units. The Union Second Corps of the Army of the Potomac, for instance, and so many other particular Confederate brigades. And you can take all these things together along with photos, early accounts, and battlefields, and then some even um, oral accounts, you know, as it got much later, and put these things together and really get a good understanding of the battlefield. However, any particular battle, especially that we're analyzing today, is inherently interpretive. You take this evidence and you might say that an account written the day after the battle is a lot more reliable than one written 20 years later, but these are some of the challenges that all historians and interpreters have in trying to interpret and understand a Civil War event. Because on the afternoon of July 2nd, 1863, Benning's Georgia Brigade charged through um, this particular gully here at Devil's Den. In 1913, a guy named William R. Houghton came back and wrote home to his newspaper complaining about the lack of Confederate monuments, but also wrote about the place that he had fought 50 years earlier. He specifically wrote about charging through a rock-filled gorge, and he remembers the line of blue-coated regulars um, above him, not quite 20 feet. He also talked about how the gallant muse and a guy named Mays also were shot through the head by the almost vertical fire from these rocks. So you stop, and I went and looked back, and there is in fact a guy named Houghton um, fighting here in the second Georgia on July 2nd, 1863, and indeed there was somebody named Muse and somebody named Mays that were shot um, and killed with head wounds that day. So Houghton is, is at least relating something that really happened, and his account continues. He says that Mays fell to his left, striking his feet, and he said that the Government Avenue now runs over the spot where it happened, and not a few yards away from a sign that says Devil's Den on it. And this is really important to me because, stick with me, here you have a guy that fought in the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863 and comes back in 1913 and uses a road put in in 1897 and a sign put in in 1900 to tell us today what happened in 1863. Okay, so you can use an early account about what the Second Georgia did. You can use his reference to a road that wasn't here during the battle but is here now and was here when the veterans came back and a sign to help us understand a little better. And finally, if his account is correct about where these guys fell, the second Georgia isn't exactly where I expected them to be. I always thought they were further out in that direction as opposed to closer to the rocks. And now as a historian, I have to deal with that. This is the type of things uh, historians really have to get into all the time. So now, we, before we begin our real intense historical discussion with uh, Dr. Joe Fitzharris, I'm going to have to give you the personal question that we ask every one of our guests. Okay. So the, I'm not singling you out here. Everybody gets it. Uh, we have 172 shopping days left until Christmas. What was the most favorite Christmas present you ever received? Uh, a Lionel train set. Lionel train set. How old were you then? Probably about six, seven, something like that. What 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 makes that one stand out the most in your mind? Uh, not only was it uh, fun to play with, but uh, I have this memory of my uncle sitting on a little chair running it, oh. and uh, he was rather a favorite. So. Okay. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. Now, discussing history, um, mm -hmm. you know, you just saw the Civil War in Four Minutes video, and have you had any of those similar types of, of, um, like, especially at the end when he mentioned about how he didn't think that the Second Georgia was as mm -hmm. close to Devil's Den as yes. they were. Have you had any of yes. those similar types of breakthroughs? Yes. Uh, I'm working on a history of the 3rd Minnesota Infantry, which uh, was surrendered by its officers at Murfreesboro in, on 13 July 1862 to Nathan Bedford Forrest. Every history of that event, you can go through all of the Confederate reports, all of the official Union reports, uh, all of that kind of stuff, they all locate both the 3rd Minnesota's camp and the action where it fought Forrest, uh, and I'm only seizing part of the story, on the east side of the west branch of Stones River. 
okay. on a place called the Murphy Farm where the house was. And they think the camp was just a little further away, a little further north from the, quote, battlefield. Trouble is, when you get period topographic maps like Ed Barr's map of the Stones River battlefield and, with the Ed, original Ed, vegetation. And, and Ed Barr's is the historian emeritus of the National Park Service. Yes. For those who don't know. He did wonderful work. But he went through all the available records and located where were the four woods, where were the fields, where were the buildings, and so on. If you take a standard uh, infantry camp, there is no room for it on the east bank. And if you read the letters and diaries of the men, you realize it had to be somewhere else. It had to be, and I had a connected through Steve Osmond to a digger. And Steve uh, Osmond was from, uh, he was the Minnesota Historical Society's Fort Snelling expert. No. He connected me with a, a digger, a former uh, deputy sheriff in Rutherford County, really a nice guy, who took me around. I was down for a Society for Military History conference in Murfreesboro, and so I went down, went down early, and he took me around. We looked at these sites, and we agreed. It had to be not on the East Bank, but on the West Bank, not only that, but it had to be west of both the Nashville Pike and the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad line, which both of which are still pretty much where they were. Well, this throws the whole thing off. Mm -hmm. And it's symptomatic of all of the problems with the, quote, official history of that day and that engagement. And one of the things that will happen in the book, God willing that it gets published, uh, is uh, a revision, massive revision of that history. So where exactly have you located the camp? Uh, I think we know exactly where it had to be within uh, the boundaries of the pike, the pike surrounding it. Okay. So that we can get it within 50 to 100 yards. Which is a whole lot better than the way it was. Yes. What other kind of research have you done? I mean, you have Third Minnesota and now Vicksburg. I mean, did they have anything to they do with that? They were at Vicksburg. They are one of the three infantry regiments that go to Vicksburg. They're, they are brought home as prisoners of war to fight the Indians. They are the force multiplier that breaks Little Crow's assault. They go back south, making a long story and a fun story short, and leaving out all the good stuff. We will get to the good stuff. And they go to uh, southern Kentucky, where Fort Heman, Fort Henry okay. are on the Tennessee River. It's called the Jackson Purchase Area, filled with gorillas. And they set up shop at Fort Heman using the Brownwater Navy's transports and gunboats for mobility. All of them are mounted. They seize enough mules to get mounted. And so they're ranging all over northern Tennessee, all the way down to Florence, Alabama, all the way up into the Jackson Purchase. One of the men will earn a Medal of Honor for his actions. Conquered in 1917, he's still alive. Wow. And the standards were higher then for Civil War action, so he really probably earned it. Uh, so that's where they uh, go before they go to Vicksburg. Now, were they on the, in the bio campaign prior to the siege? No. Okay. They come down in early June of 1863, and they are brought all the way up to past Snyder's Bluff and Hines Bluff to uh, Sataria, which is about, depending on how you count it, somewhere around 35 or 40 miles northeast of the city. That's where they disembark and they move inland. They are part of the protection force okay. guarding the siege lines from Joe Johnston's uh, army lurking around Jackson. Okay. Well, we are actually going to do one other video. Before we really get into the intricacies of Vicksburg, uh, we do have another Civil War in four minutes. We're going to cover staff rides. Oh, good. I like staff rides.
Today, I want to talk to you about military staff rides. This is a method for developing leaders. It requires the study of a battle, the visit of a battlefield, and then the analysis of results to not only glean the lessons of what took place at that battle, but to might apply today. Carl von Clausewitz would say that participants in a staff ride need to achieve critical analysis. They under need to understand the facts, the cause and effect, and then study the results. I would say more simply, they need to understand the what, the so what, and the now what. That is, what happened, what were the results then, and what does it mean to us today? Now they say the first staff rides were conducted by Helmut von Molke the Elder. He would take the Prussian general staff out to key pieces of terrain where they would ride their horses to study the ground and concepts that they wanted to apply. Because he had his staff and because they were riding on horses, we get the term staff ride. These really take off in the United States in 1906 when Major Eben Swift of what is now the Army Command and General Staff College takes 12 students down to the Chickamauga battlefield and there they study it. Because of this purpose of developing leaders, it led to a revival of staff rides in the 1970s that continues into this day. Now, staff rides are really about three steps. The first of which is to identify a historical event, a battle or a campaign that you can go visit, and then do preliminary study to understand its context, key actors, and principal actions. And then to visit the ground, to go stand on the, the, the actual terrain where those commanders stood, suspending that you know how it turned out, using only the knowledge that they had at the time, and then assess the merits and follies of their decision. And then to provide analysis, using your study, the walking of the ground in your own experience, to glean the lessons of the day and how they might apply to our day. Now, battlefields give us all kind of enduring lessons that we can learn. Because warfare is an inherent human activity, uh, we bring with us all the great talents and flaws of humans. So it becomes a wonderful laboratory to study critical thinking, decision making, communication, planning, execution, failure, success, uh, courage, and fear. And because we think about war as the clash of wills, uh, it, it, obviously it makes sense that staff rides are a wonderful tool to train military leaders. But if you think about this clash of wills as conflict, all of a sudden, battlefields become wonderful laboratories to train leaders and educate them from all walks. And we add in ideas like time, resources, or a lack thereof of friction that makes the simple hard, of fog, the information that is unknown without which leaders still must make decisions. We see that battlefields are the equivalent of libraries full of leadership books. When the War Department took over many of these Civil War battlefields, they expected that staff rides would take place. Much of the infrastructure, the roads, the tablets that listed the units, uh, the towers that were built out on the fields were to help facilitate this learning process. And today, Civil War battlefields, American Revolutionary War battlefields, and war battlefields from the War of 18 are still ideal places to conduct a staff ride. Organizations like the Civil War Trust and others are dedicated to the preservation of those American battlefields. In 1886, when Colonel Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain came to dedicate the monument to his regiment at Gettysburg, he said, generations that know us not and we know not of will be heart drawn to see where and by whom great things were suffered and done on their behalf. And they will come to these deathless fields to ponder and dream. I think that Colonel Chamberlain, a leader and an educator, would be thrilled at the prospect that these battlefields were being used as laboratories to conduct staff rides, to ponder and dream for the development of the technical and conceptual leaders or competence that leaders need to deal with all the issues of today and tomorrow. And so with us is retired Professor Joe Fitz Harris from the University of St. Thomas. Now before we play that video, you said, I love staff rides. Well, they're fun. Uh, one, uh, the Marine Corps University took a group of military historians from the Society for Military History out on a staff ride for Chancellorsville. And uh, the part that would be enjoyable, if you remember the battlefield, it's divided by several highways. So there we are trying to analyze mm -hmm. not a battlefield mo moment, but a uh, question of moral integrity, where the median <laughs> traffic whizzing by studying morality, not war, not logistics. Now that is definitely a moral question. Yes. That you might have also probably been able to also find the answer to the question, why did the chicken cross the road? 
out of terror. <laughs> <laughs> now you said you were also on one other staff ride? Uh, Antietam. Antietam. Again, that was a, That's one of my favorite battlefields. Uh, one of the uh, faculty of Marine Corps University, the Command and Staff College, took us and walked our feet off. So it was very good. So what, uh, did you have any takeaways from that staff ride at Antietam? Antietam, well, you really appreciate when you come upon the sunken road, any sunken road on a battlefield, of course, to do the same thing. The importance of cover in terrain. Yes. You see it again at uh, uh, Mary's Heights. Yes. And so on. So, uh, and we'll see it in Vicksburg where if you can get into the right position, nobody can shoot at you. Yeah. Getting there is the problem. <laughs> so and, true. And where do you go from there is the other problem. And uh, once they solve that pair of problems. So now looking at staff rides, mm -hmm. being an academic who, you didn't have any military experience, no. did you? Okay. Yeah. So being an academic, you've studied, you've walked the battlefields, mm -hmm. you've read the reports, you, you, you see the, yep. over, the broad overview, mm -hmm. some of the specific details. Then you go on to a staff ride. Yep. And you're watching the younger students. Yep. Is there anything that, from hearing their viewpoints of how they would do things that kind of you well, know, enlighten you a little bit? Sometimes because sometimes they will come up with solutions that, uh, or arguments for a decision that uh, older and wiser heads wouldn't come up with. But very often the people making those decisions were much younger than the, the older and wiser heads. That's the reason I brought that yes. up, actually. And, uh, what uh, someone who's in their 50s would consider risky, uh, someone in their late 20s, let us say, would not. Yep. Um, but then, of course, they would look aghast at what their 19-year-old privates were willing to do. That's so true. <laughs> and uh, I think we'll leave it at that <laughs> before we have an audience throwing things at us <laughs> for age discrimination yeah, on all well, ends uh, of that spectrum. Especially coming from all of the... Uh, all of the veterans who do watch this show, um, you know, I, I think this, I think all you guys do kind of get what we're talking about yeah. here. Uh, you know, there was a situation straying away from the Civil War where I was fortunate enough to give the keynote eulogy for Duff Gordon's funeral. Mm -hmm. now, Duff Gordon is, was one of the first people repatriated back to the United States from the USS Oklahoma at Pearl Harbor. <laughs> and he was a 50-year-old chief petty officer when he died. Yep. I was the only person there, because I had looked through his military service record, I was the only person there who actually had looked at his entire career. Now, a lot of the active duty guys and reservists who were there, even chief petty officers, they were kind of like, well, we're doing this more as a formality. Yep. We don't really know this guy. And you can kind of see there was no emotional connection yep. with them. And I remember when I was looking at some of the disciplinary things that, uh, that Chief Petty Officer Gordon was going through in his career, and he was busted for drinking, and he was busted for this, and he's busted yeah. for that, all when he was younger, but you could see that maturity go through his career. Mm -hmm. And then I looked over at all the chiefs and I said, now, how many of you have identified now with where Chief Gordon was? And you can see the entire room changed, that these guys realized that the person that was being buried that day was one of them. Yep, precisely. And that the indiscretions from the youth when you're a young, you know, young sailor, a seaman second class, you learn the hard way, you make your mistakes, but you see that, that maturity, and they were all there. The same things have all happened to them. I was an E6 in the Air Force. 
I know my little youthful indiscretions, thankfully nothing serious. Um, <laughs> minor infractions, uh, people were doing much worse than me. Uh, but the fact is, as you get older and you get into that mid-range NCO ranks, you know, you, you grow up and you grow mm -hmm. up in a hurry. And you know, then especially when you're overseas now in a combat zone, that really matures you in a hurry. Yes. And I, I actually had met the, um, going back into the Civil War at Franklin, the uh, CEO of the Battle of Franklin Trust, mm -hmm. said, uh, um, Eric Jacobson. And there he was standing at the Carter House at Franklin just before the 150th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And he said something really profound at the end of his remarks that has never left me. And that is he considers the Civil War generation to be the greatest generation. No offense to the World War II generation, but when you look at the style of warfare and you look at the, at the amount of casualties the, after the war that these guys did the best that they could for the rest of their days to make sure that war never happened again. Yeah. And when I see the number of wars that happened since World War II, <laughs> I think Eric Jacobson is right in that regard. Well, it's an interesting proposition. I'll have to think on that one. So, anyhow, we are going to actually transition now over to the Battle of Vicksburg, and uh, we're going to take a look at our last Civil War in four minutes segment on the Vicksburg campaign. By the spring of 1863, Major General Ulysses S. Grant, in command of the Union Army of the Tennessee, was at a crossroads in his career. There was tremendous clamor in the northern press demanding that President Abraham Lincoln remove Grant as commander of the Western Army. Even members of the cabinet urged the president to replace Grant. But the president responded to those critical of Grant by saying, I can't spare this man. He fights. Thus, by late spring, Grant, realizing that the only viable option left him was to march his army south through Louisiana from his base camps at Milliken's Bend and Young's Point and hurl his army across the mighty river somewhere below the fortress city of Vicksburg and operate against the Confederate citadel from the south and east, the area in which the Confederates would least expect him. Thus, on March the 29th, the orders were issued to begin this movement south through Louisiana, and as the soldiers slogged their way south, corduroying roads and building bridges each step of the way, the Union fleet, commanded by Rear Admiral David Dixon Porter, successfully passed by the batteries of Vicksburg in a fiery display on, on the evening of April the 16th, and by the end of the month had rendezvoused with Grant at Hard Times Landing, well south of Vicksburg. From that location, on April 30th and into May 1st, Grant would hurl his army across the mighty river and onto Mississippi soil, and the inland campaign to capture Vicksburg began. Over the next 17 days, in what is often referred to as the Blitzkrieg of the Vicksburg Campaign, Grant's forces would push deep into the interior of the state of Mississippi, meeting an overwhelming Confederate resistance in five separate actions at Port Gibson on May 1st, Raymond on May 12th. Two days later, they would capture the capital city of Jackson. Not wishing to waste combat troops in occupation of Mississippi's capital city, Grant ordered Jackson neutralized militarily. And by that I mean he freely applied the torch to machine shops and factories, cut up railroad lines and telegraph lines. Anything of military value was destroyed. With Jackson neutralized, Grant turned west toward his objective, the fortress city of Vicksburg. And between Jackson and Vicksburg, he would again encounter Confederate forces, this time at Champion Hill on May the 16th. In the largest, bloodiest, and most decisive action of the Vicksburg campaign, Grant would drive Confederate forces led by Lieutenant General John Pemberton from the field of battle in panic and confusion. The following day, along the line of the Big Black, Grant would once again overwhelm Confederate forces and drive them back into the city's defenses. Having defeated the Confederate forces in five separate actions, Grant believed that those men responsible for the defense of Vicksburg were greatly demoralized and thought that a quick show of force early on would result in a speedy capitulation of the fortress city. Thus, on May 19 and again on May the 22nd, Grant would hurl his army against the city's fortifications. Although men in blue succeeded in planting their colors atop the parapets in several different areas, they would finally be checked and hurled back with heavy loss. Grant would then decide, as he put it, to outcamp the enemy and lay siege to the city. 
Throughout the month of May, Grant would slowly extend his lines to the left and to the right until they completely encircled the Confederate garrison in Vicksburg. Once the line of circumvallation was established, Grant's forces then began sinking approaches toward the Confederate line. Thirteen separate approaches would be constructed throughout the month of June by Union forces, the largest and most successful of which would be along the Jackson Road and known as Logan's Approach. On June the 25th, Union sappers would detonate a mine at the end of Logan's approach directly beneath the 3rd Louisiana Redan, one of the powerful bastions guarding the Jackson Road entry point into the city of Vicksburg. Although the battle raged in fury for hours and the crater itself slowly filled with the dead and dying men in blue and gray, the Union forces would be denied entrance into the city that day. But by July 1st, Grant's forces had closed all along the line to within just a few yards of the Confederate fortifications. Confederate General John Pemberton, realizing that there would be no help from outside, knowing that his supplies and munitions and rations would soon be exhausted, and knowing that within just a few more days of digging, Union forces could detonate 13 separate mines underneath his fortifications, opened up negotiations with Grant for the surrender of the city. And on July the 4th, the 47th day of siege, the Union Army would march in and take possession of the fortress city that had eluded them for so long. By gaining Vicksburg in July of 1863, it would give the North undisputed control of the Mississippi River, divide the Southern Confederacy in two, and effectively seal the doom of Richmond. Okay, so now our, let's commence our discussion about the Battle and Siege of Vicksburg with uh, retired Professor uh, Dr. Joe Fitzharris from the University of St. Thomas. Now, during that video, you were telling me you disagreed with something? Well, I thought Winchell uh, lacked uh, explanation of why they wanted Vicksburg. So why do they want Vicksburg? It's part of the uh, Union strategy, and you have to remember that the Union did not really get its strategic act together uh, for some time. Uh, there's considerable argument about uh, strategy, and of course part of that argument gets buried in the sloganeering of the press and the politicians on to Richmond, or from the Southern perspective, on to Washington. Uh, totally absurd ideas, but there you are. Uh, in 1861, Winfield Scott articulated a strategy which uh, stood the test of time fairly well. He wanted to surround the Confederacy to cut it off from, the, uh, from resupply, either from the northern states or from elsewhere, and then to chop it in half, basically, down the Mississippi, and then chop it again through Chattanooga to the sea, and then trap whatever was left in the East Coast. Um, this is a rough articulation. Uh, it gets polished up. Um, in 1863, you've got three major movements, two Union and one Confederate. The Confederate is Lee's raid into uh, Pennsylvania. And it's what it is. It's a raid. Yeah. Gettysburg is the end result, and it doesn't really change anything. For, it's of, not a turning yeah, point. As, as big of a battle as it was. Yep. Status quo, ante, still runs. Instead, Probably about the only thing you can say about Gettysburg was just that it decimated, uh, especially the Confederacy, it just decimated right. the Eastern Theater numbers. Right. The other two offensives are Rosecrans' Tullahoma offensive, which takes control of Middle Tennessee, takes Kentucky and Tennessee out of play for the Confederacy. They can't get the resources, the horses, uh, forces the Confederacy to fall back across the Tennessee River onto Chattanooga. And of course, part of the problem is that the Union's movement down the Tennessee, which resulted in Pittsburgh Landing or Shiloh and then Corinth, you've also had the Union pushing east down the Memphis and Chattanooga, or Charleston rather, railroad. So the Confederacy is being shoved back into Chattanooga. So that's one offensive. The other offensive is aimed which the one we're looking at, at Vicksburg. Because Vicksburg and Port Hudson, under Confederate control, blocked the Union use of the river. 
once those two points fell, the Union had not only full control of the river and could move its men and supplies anywhere it wanted, and it cut off the Trans-Mississippi Theater. That's not a big deal, though. Yeah. At first it was. At first the it was a big target, but by uh, the spring of 1863, it's dawned on the Union uh, slowly. I mean, General Halleck still wants an offensive mm -hmm. into Texas in 1864. That's the Red River campaign. Uh, really, uh, the Trans-Mississippi Theater doesn't amount to much. But Vicksburg, taking Vicksburg, which is, becomes a strategic goal along with taking Chattanooga in 1863, uh, in Rosecrans does take Chattanooga, fights Chickamauga, loses it, and is besieged in Chattanooga, and we'll leave them there. You can do that another year. Uh, we'll be covering that in November. Yeah. <laughs> Vicksburg falling opens Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana, whatever was left of Louisiana, to Union infiltration as they want. The Union can go anywhere they want. And what's interesting is we've overlooked it, but the Tom Bigby Valley in Mississippi and Alabama is one of the key supply points, along with northern Georgia, for the armies in the east, the Confederate armies in the east. Over a rickety r railroad network, which wasn't connected at all, you can come in one end of town, unload, yeah. reload at the other end of town, and off you go till the Union cuts your rail line. Now looking at the Mississippi River, mm -hmm. You know, we keep talking about Vicksburg, mm -hmm. but was that just the last remaining stronghold? Were there well, more? There I know were there more. Was, there's Fort uh, Pillow. Well, in 1861, of course, yeah. we have the Confederate defensive line from Bowling Green through Columbus, Kentucky, and Island Number 10, and we have the famous chain across the river between Belmont and uh, Columbus. And, of course, when... Uh, Fort Henry and Fort Donelson fall, that breaks the chain of, fort of defensive works, and Bragg has to pull his forces back into Tennessee, and he abandons Columbus, he abandons Belmont, he abandons uh, Nashville, because yeah. suddenly Union gunboats are all the way up past Nashville. He's got to fall back out of range, and so he falls back to Murfreesboro where we'll fight the Battle of Stones River at the end of 1862, beginning of 1863. And that's where the 3rd Minnesota Company C was captured? Nope. nope. Yeah. No, yeah. Well, they don't fight there. Yeah. No. Fight for company C has a totally different history. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah, well, 3rd Minnesota yeah, yeah. wasn't there. Okay. They were in Murfreesboro in, the, in July. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. It, there was a lot of fighting down there, so yes, I don't even, I well, didn't, you know. It, it's a core junction. Yeah. 11 macadamized, or in other words, good roads, turnpikes, the connected county seats with Nashville, come together at Murfreesboro, ah. along with the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad. And see, even as somebody who studied the Civil War as much as I have, there are still occasionally things I still learn, mm -hmm. and that is one of them, because I never really understood yeah. the importance of see, Murfreesboro. Out east, but then there are, two re there are two parts of the Civil War I really haven't covered in my studies. Murfreesboro being one of them, Vicksburg being the other. <laughs> and I've got Pachacha on both of them. The trick to the Western theater, understanding what's going on and why we go where we go, is that there's two ways to move anything. Water or rail. Yep. Going overland by wagon, you can go about three days from your supply base, and then everything you haul will be eaten by the mules. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. At that point, you're just feeding mules. Why bother? Yeah. If you can move it by either rail or, better yet, by steamboat. And that brings us back to Vicksburg. It's not a rail hub particularly, although a rail line to Jackson, from Vicksburg to Jackson, the, that's the line Pemberton retreats from uh, before Grant. Okay. Back. Grant drives him down that rail line into uh, So now, city. With, specifically with Minnesotans, we had mm. the 4th Minnesota, and the, you said that they made the voyage? They, 4th Minnesota, and they will be part of the group on the transports that run the guns. As you just saw in that uh, last yeah. video. The 5th Minnesota and the 1st Light Artillery Battery both make the march that they showed down the west shore of okay. the river to uh, Hard Time Landing. 
The third Minnesota will come in in June of 1863 from uh, Fort Heman and take up their positions as part of that protection force. The uh, contra contravallation line, that's the technical term for the protective force protecting the siege lines, the circumlocation, circumvallation, blah, blah, blah. and uh, they'll spend their time building field fortifications. Okay. And sweating in the sun, it's hot, the sun bakes them, and of course the water's bad, and several people, not in this unit, but in neighboring units get eaten by floating logs called uh, alligators. Wow. Yeah. Well, actually, we're going to take a quick pause here to look at a video from the Vicksburg National Military Park. Aha. This is the entrance to the United States National Cemetery here in Vicksburg, Mississippi, established in 1866 for soldiers who were killed within a 50-mile radius of the city of Vicksburg. My name is David Maggio. I'm one of the guides in the Vicksburg National Military Park. One of the features that I personally like about becoming a guide and being a guide is the many stories that you learn and the many facts that you learn about the park. Behind me is the naval ironclad, the USS Cairo, named after Cairo, Illinois, one of seven city-class ironclads that were built to control the Mississippi River. An underwater floating mine blows this massive hole in the side of the ship and it sinks in 36 feet of water in 12 minutes. 170 men aboard the ship and all 170 get off without anybody being severely hurt. In this cemetery, there are over 17,000 soldiers buried here from the United States Civil War. Over 13,000, three quarters of those soldiers are unknown soldiers. This cemetery, when it was established, paid 50 cents for the body of every Union soldier that was brought here to be buried in this cemetery. This is the largest United States National Cemetery dedicated to Union soldiers killed during the American Civil War. This is the Illinois Monument. This monument is one quarter the size of the Pantheon in Rome, so you get that same reverberation. Hello! I've had choirs coming in here. In this room, with this echo in you here, it is the type of thing that gives you goosebumps. There are a number of stories that I hear in the Vicksburg Military Park. One of the most interesting is a gentleman by the name of Albert D.J. Cashier. He fought here in Vicksburg. When he's hurt in an accident, do they realize that Albert is actually a woman, making him one of the only few people in the country to serve as a woman during the American Civil War. Over on the South Loop, there's a gentleman there. His name is Peter Haynes. He was a lieutenant here in Vicksburg. He fought here during the campaign. In 1917, he's called back to active duty. This makes him the only man in the United States to serve as an officer during the Civil War and during the First World War. This is one of the many stories that you'll see of the individuals that fought here during the campaign and the battle for Vicksburg. So come and see us and enjoy the Vicksburg National Military Park. And we're here with Joe, Dr. Joe Fitzharris, the retired professor of history from the University of St. Thomas. And so now here we are mm -hmm. talking about Vicksburg and the Minnesota's yep. contributions to that. Okay. Um, so what do you have? You know, what can you tell the readers that are the readers, the viewers? The viewers that uh, uh, well, the Fourth Minnesota, which was raised along with my little regiment, the Third Minnesota. Uh, they stay home for the winter of 1862, or 61 rather, guarding the forts along the frontier, and then go south in the spring. Uh, they're at Vicksburg. Their colonel is commanding brigade and sometimes the division they're in. It's John Sanborn, formerly the adjutant general. And they are sent 
right before uh, Grant and Foote, or Porter rather, run the guns, uh, there's a Yazoo Pass expedition as the Sherman takes forces up through some bayous and so on to try and work his way northeast of Vicksburg to a place called Hain around Haynes Bluff. I've seen the map of Haynes Bluff's fortifications. They're powerful fortifications wow. with really big heavy artillery in them. I don't know why they put really heavy artillery up there, but they did. And where the Confederates got it, I have no idea. And then to try and cut Vicksburg off from the Confederacy. Well, that failed. So he brings his troops back to Milliken's Bluff, fourth included. They get on transports the next couple days. Downriver they go, run the guns, and land at uh, just outside Grand Gulf on the east shore and began moving inland as part of Grant's invasion force. Uh, 5th Minnesota, meanwhile, is also at Milliken's Bend, and so is the 1st Light Artillery. They will make that laborious march down to Hard Times Landing and get ferried across, and then they will be also in the march, at least the 5th will be on the march to Jackson. And if they tell the story right, the 5th had a reputation for being good skirmishers, and they have uh, the privilege of leading their corps and their division and their brigade as the skirmisher lead force, go take point, 5th Minnesota, all the way to Jackson. So they're the first ones to engage the Confederates at every point. Uh, first Light Artillery doesn't fire its guns in anger until it gets not to Jackson, but all the way to Vicksburg. Wow. And takes its position in the siege lines, which are basically infantry lines guarding the gaps between the batteries. And Grant put every gun he could lay his hands on. Porter will send some of his heavy naval guns ashore to be used. And they will bombard uh, Vicksburg 24-7. For how long? Uh, starts, I think it's the 18th or 19th of May, and continues until the night of the 3rd, 4th. So July. now, I, I, when we had set this up for you coming on, I had sent you an email regarding a certain hurricane or tropical yes. storm. Have, have you been able to look into that at all to see if the weather had any bearing as to what was going well, on at the end of May and June, beginning of June? Every report I see, and I went through and looked for any after-action report, that's the reports unit commanders file after they've done And this something. goes back to our whole discussion earlier on about researching the Civil right. War. As I've discovered or, you know, was provided more information and gave it to Dr. Fitzharris, and now he's actually looking to see if this new information yeah. actually made a yeah. revelant. Yeah, there's a, the Amata hurricane in uh, May of 1863. It's... The first, the earliest hurricane we've had, an off-season off hurricane, historically, that then we, need, we know about. Okay. Hits Florida, comes across the Gulf Coast, and comes up uh, in uh, Alabama, cuts through northern Mississippi, far northeast Mississippi, so it's way far away from Vicksburg. So it doesn't affect Vicksburg, it doesn't show up in any of the after-action reports. Where it hits, the third Minnesota is got about four companies out on chasing guerrillas in uh, southeast Kentucky, that Jackson Purchase area. Ah, uh, that's where and it hits. That's where they get the rain. Okay. <laughs> and I didn't know where the rain, why they were complaining about the weather till you told me about that hurricane. Mm -hmm. And I looked at the plot, yep. with which the, they say it hits up in uh, ja Kentucky, Tennessee, in on the 30th of May, well, that's right when those guys are out there slogging through the marshes trying to find gorillas. And now we know why they were complaining so much. Yes. Have you ever been in a hurricane? 
Yes. Okay, because I know I, I was in Hurricane Floyd in 1999. I've never seen so much rain fall out of the sky so quickly as as in that storm. And I also remember uh, there was a stop sign that was wiggling like this, and they would catch yeah. a wind gust, and it would be 90 degrees, and yeah. then it would come back over and snap, and then it would be hovering like this. It would bend but not break. That's yes. how bad the winds are. Yeah. And I can't even imagine sloshing through the uh, purchase area. You well, know, they, like they were just getting rain. Yeah. And it was, by that time, probably moderately heavy rain. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know that they didn't complain too much about the wind, so I think the winds were da not bad. But uh, there you have. So, so now we've, we've only third got. Third Minnesota, then we'll make that trek down okay. and guard. So now you've got the fourth, the fifth, the first, and the third. So now bring us into, uh, we've got about four or five minutes left. Uh, July. Okay. July 1863 at Vicksburg. All right. And the fall. Well, on the night of the 3rd, one of the letter writers in the 3rd Minnesota uh, noted that there was a quiet. The guns fell silent. And everybody was of the opine that somewhere, somebody was going to stage an assault the next morning. And of course, the next morning, there was a national salute. That's firing one gun for each state. So it was 34 guns. And uh, the news f flowed through the Army by telegraph. The uh -huh. Army had already learned information is valuable, and the faster you share it, not just to the people you know need it, but to everybody. So every major headquarters is linked by telegraph. So that news goes all over the place in a big hurry. And of course, as soon as it hits the gossip network, then it moves at light speed. Yep. And so everybody knew, and the cheering began. And for whatever reason, John Sandburg's brigade was chosen to be the first Union unit to enter the city. And it was led by the Verdampt, 4th Minnesota's brass band. Every regiment has a field music. Mm -hmm. Not every regiment had a brass band of fancy wind instruments. The state had provided the money for that for both the third and fourth. Sandburn, who knew he was going to command the fourth, made sure the fourth got all the money. So the third never had a real brass band. Uh -huh. So they pray it in, tootly toot, and put their flag on the courthouse. Okay, so the so, a Minnesota flag was the first one yep. on the courthouse at Vicksburg yeah. on the 4th of July of 1863, yes. and the Mississippians have not liked it ever since. They did not celebrate the 4th of July until sometime in late World War II. I was down in uh, Vicksburg on the 4th of July, and they were actually doing illumination. Oh. And uh, they, they gra uh, generally, generally admitted that probably it was okay to be part of the country, but uh, there was a certain ambivalence. Yes, now, these were white Mississippians, obviously. I don't think the black Mississippians uh, had too, too many uh, ambivalent problems. Well, we're going to call it quits on Vicksburg for right now, but I do know that you wrote a book on World War II, because you just mentioned World War II, Patents Fighting Bridge Builders, Company B of the 1303rd Engineer General Service Regiment. And how can you pick this up? Well, it's available at uh, Amazon, obviously, and it won the or was a finalist for the Army Writing Award in 2007. And combat engineers who knew the European theater say that's the way it was. So, but, uh, is it available on Kindle, Amazon? Just uh, as far as I know, just Amazon books. Uh, I have no idea if it's been available. I haven't looked. <laughs> you have to look. <laughs> I've been too busy with the third Minnesota to go find out what this poor book is doing. And how is the, in, in 15 seconds, how is the progress on the third Minnesota book? We are awaiting word from the Oklahoma University Press on whether they will publish it or not. The readers liked it. It's been going through committees this month, and assuming both committees met and whatever other processes, I'm hoping to hear sometime either between now and, say, mid-July. 
Dr. Joe Fitzharris, thank you for joining us at you, North Star Oasis. And for producer Dallas Pearson, I'm your host, Jeff Williams, reminding you we have 172 shopping days left until Christmas. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.